We'll now reconvene to open session. Time is 7.08 p.m. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. This is just a reminder that the meetings of the board are open to the public, but are not a meeting of the public. Um, the board has received the agenda and all supporting documentation several days in advance of this regular meeting. And that allows us to ask and receive answers to many of our questions in advance of this regular meeting. Therefore, len lengthy discussions are not always necessary on every agenda item. And with that, we'll get started with our ceremonials, and tonight we have our colors presented by Kingwood Park High School. Colors and hugs. Colors, arms. Colors, arms. observe a moment of silence. Thank you, may be seated. Our next item is item 3E, our commendations and recognitions. For that, I'll turn it over to administration. Thank you. Tonight, Inspiring Moment will be a live performance. I am proud to introduce the Big Bang Percussion Ensemble from Oak Forest Elementary School. These fourth and fifth grade students have been chosen to perform this Friday at the Texas Music Educators Association and Clinic in San Antonio. Oak Forest Elementary School is one of only eight elementary groups in the state selected to perform at this state conference. The Big Bang began in 2015 with 11 members and a few drums, but Jenny Olges, the director, applied for and received a grant from the Umbel ISD Education Foundation that allowed her to purchase additional instruments and involve more students. The Big Bang will perform two songs for us tonight. Let's welcome the Big Bang.
Was amazing. Thank you so much for being here and kicking off our meeting with that live performance. Thank you, Mrs. Olgies, the students, for representing Humble ISD at the state level. As we have this little transition, I would like to introduce Jerry Monbaron, who will uh, introduce us to this month's Super Staffers. That's it, so we can go down. That is a tough act to follow, but I'm gonna give it my best. So, Humble ISD employees go above and beyond each day to meet the needs of our students, and we want to recognize these employees for their important work in making Team Humble ISD great. Each month, campuses and departments select an individual to be honored as a super staffer for their outstanding work in advancing student achievement. A drawing is held, and three honorees receive additional recognition at the school board meeting, including a gift card thanks to an award sponsor. And this month's Super Staffer Award sponsor is the Emble ISD Education Foundation. And so joining us tonight from the foundation is their chair, Jen Sitton. Being honored as the elementary Super Staffer tonight is Nancy Torres from Jack Fields Elementary. <laughs> joining Nancy up front is Karen Weeks, principal of Jack Fields Elementary. And let me read a little bit of what they said about Nancy. She knows the true meaning of teaching to all modalities. She consistently brings curriculum to life in such a way that students are excited about learning. Many times upon entering her room, you will hear her singing and playing the guitar to build classroom culture and of course, making learning fun. Academic learning time is considered precious to Nancy and she utilizes every possible minute to reinforce learning objectives. Nancy not only brings energy to her classroom, but also the entire campus. Congratulations, Nancy. As the secondary super staffer tonight is Carla Corpus from Wood Creek Middle School. <laughs> Joining Carla up front is Brian Applegate, the principal. And this is what was said about Carla, who she is a um, guidance counselor at Wood Creek Middle. Carla is everything you could ask for in a school guidance counselor. She unfailingly models the very attributes, attributes of a portrait of a graduate to our children through her leadership, initiative, and concern for our students. 
With an ever-present smile and a sunny disposition, she seeks out opportunities to share her outlook on life and relationships, turning tears into joy wherever she goes. You will not find a more super staffer member anywhere. Wood Creek Middle School and the Humble ISD community would like to thank Carla for giving her very best and, ta and talent, time and talent to our students and staff. Thank you, Carla, for all that you do. And last but not least, being honored as our support super staffer tonight is Cheryl Jones, the CTE secretary, Kate secretary. <laughs> Joining Cheryl up front is the CTE coordinator, Christy Starkey. And this is what was read or what was written about Cheryl. There are many words to describe Cheryl Jones. Patient, kind, and hardworking are just a few. Whether it's processing hundreds of purchase orders for the CTE department or facilitating the Humble ISD annual livestock show, Cheryl goes above and beyond to serve our students and faculty. Humble ISD CTE is extremely fortunate to have her with within our family. And a last round of applause for all of our super staffers. Our next item for business is item 3F, our questions and comments by patrons or employees of the district. And we have some of those who have signed up to speak. Um, we'll begin with Ms. Caitlin Sitton. Today I will be talking to all of you about my service project called Sock Out Cancer. But first, I would like to thank my dad, Robertson, my man, <laughs> for giving me this opportunity to speak at the board meeting tonight. I wanted to come before you this evening to challenge you all to donate to my project. And if you have, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> my project is all about giving back. Giving back to the kids at Texas Children's Hospital who are battling the terrible disease of cancer. Last year, I had a different service project called Hats Off for a Cure. I collected over 1,500 hats last year. That's a lot. This year, I am doing a service project called, hat so called Sock Out Cancer. All the socks that I collect will go to the kids at Texas Children's Hospital. My goal this year is to collect at least 3,000 pairs of super fun, crazy cool, epic, awesome, cozy socks. I got inspired to do this project because of an L3 event I participated in two years ago. I heard a person named Mr. Scott say to try to make a difference, and that's what this project is all about, making a difference for those kids at Texas Children's Hospital. All the socks for my project will help all those kids at the hospital by bringing them comfort and joy. I am collecting the socks at my dad, Robert Sitton's office at 18455 Westlake Houston Parkway, Suite 150, and at Tammy Heights Level's office at Remax in Kingwood, 2940 Oak Street. Again, thank you so much for allowing me to speak tonight. I appreciate it very much. If you have any questions about me or my project, I will gladly answer them. You can also fo follow me on Facebook and Twitter at Hot Software Cure. Thank you, and have a nice evening, folks. Also, Daddy, I love you more. Good night. <laughs> Caitlin, thank you for being here. We are so eager to support you. <laughs> 
We're eager to support you on your campaign. We know you've already had a successful campaign last year, so we'd like to help you kick off your campaign. We might have heard in advance. <laughs> Next, we will hear from Mr. Mark Malley and Jason Gay. We'll be moving on to Deborah Rose Miller. I was so hoping there'd be somebody in between after that <laughs> act, so thank you. Uh, Deborah Rose Miller, I've been in um, the Humble area now for about 16 months, and previously, before moving to Humble, I served on the Magnolia School Board for about 10 years. I was on the recent bond committee, great experience. It was my third bond committee to be on, and I have to tell you, it's much easier being the armchair quarterback than sitting where you are involved with this bond. But there was two points I just wanted to bring up. They were uh, mentioned last month uh, from the bond presentation, but I know there's three areas that we differed on between the two final committees, the natatorium, the uh, security system, and um, CT. And I think if we'd had one more meeting where the, the two bodies would have combined, you would have seen that, that we were probably unanimous um, or very far more similar than maybe it looked like on paper. We just needed bo both of us more information before we really made a final decision on that. Uh, so there was really not that much difference between, I think, the final committees. Uh, but the main point was I know that there's been conversation about having uh, the natatorium as a second bond item. Uh, I lived through two of those bonds sitting where you're sitting, and I have to admit the last time we did that, I kind of thought it was maybe the craziest thing we had ever done because during the early voting when they came back, that particular measure we had uh, it was uh, a convention. It was a different, it was a conference center, not an auditorium on that case. Um, we were behind on the early vote, but when the final votes came in, it was way ahead. And the reason why is because those people who had a vested interest came out to vote for it. And I'm concerned for our bond when it comes to May, because by the time our voters get ready for May, they would have already gone through the March elections with the Senate and the judge. We're obviously going to have a runoff in April, and they're going to be so confused come May of, that they're going to the polls again that I think by having this special interest and having the voters get to decide that, we're going to see a better turnout one way or another, yay and nay, with regard to having that separate natatorium issue so it won't hold hostage the rest of the bond package, but allow the voters to speak their mind, but more importantly, to make sure we get a good voting turnout to represent the community. So I just wanted to share those points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service as well. Uh, next we'll hear from Jennifer Kress. My name is Jennifer Kress, and I'm a parent of Humble ISD. I was also a bond board committee member. Uh, I would like to say we've placed our trust in your judgment and follow through with our recommendations. In saying this, there has been a boisterous support from the pool community, though the natatorium was voted down by both groups. I would hope that my trust has not been misplaced and that you have taken the votes recommend, re voters, excuse me, recommendation to heart. Our district needs to be fiscally responsible and taking care of the masses and the true needs versus wants. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we'll hear from Mia Hoyt.
Hi, I'm Mia Hoyt. I am an Humble ISD parent. Um, I just wanted to say I know that many of you have already taken into consideration many points that could be made for or against adding the natatorium to the bond package. I won't really go over those because it's not, you know, I think, I believe that you've probably done your research and you have your minds made up one way or another. I just want to say that I do want to support the bond committee in both of their package recommendations that do not include the natatorium. Um, I believe that they had put a lot of work and effort into to coming up with those recommendations, and I'd like, you know, I respect that. Um, I do hope that if the natatorium is added to, or if $50 million is taken away from the bond packages recommended to add the natatorium as an option, that we would have it as a separate item to vote on for the community to say yes or no, so that we do not have to vote on the bond all together with the natatorium in there, because I believe some of the funding in the bond is extremely important. So um, thank you for your consideration. Great. Thank you, Mia. And next, we'll hear from Lori Toomey. Good evening. I'm going to keep this very short and sweet because most of you already know me and have heard what I had to say. The only thing I did want to mention I just wanted to kind of call your attention to the, to the bond committee process and that on December 4th, which was the second to the last bond committee meeting, three of the four groups at that particular moment in time actually did vote in favor of keeping the natatorium in the bond. The next meeting, which was our last one, which was on December 14th, um, it did not make it into the final cut because it only had 55 percent of the vote. However, one thing to recognize is that only 79 percent of the board was present at that particular meeting because it did happen the Thursday night right before the Christmas holiday. So we may not have had the actual full representation at that particular meeting. However, I do think last month uh, the board did a great presentation on the natatorium. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ms. Toomey. All right. Next item for business is item 3G. We'll have some an action item from closed session. Mr. Sitton. It's in there. Uh, Madam President, I moved, uh, as for the personnel, I move that the board approve the administration's personnel recommendations as presented with addendum. A motion. We need a second. Second. And a second. All those in favor? Unanimous. That motion passes. Um, and we had another item. Yes, Madam President, as for the consideration of student expulsions, I move that the board approve the administration's consideration of student ex expulsions as presented. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sitton. Next um, item of business is our comments by individual board members. We'll start to my left, Ms. Morrison. Well, is Caitlin still here? She has homework. Oh, she has homework. Okay. Well, just a, a huge kudos to her. And uh, I'm going to make it short. I want to thank everybody that spoke tonight. Thank you for participating and being valued uh, members of our community. And uh, so I want to say hats off to the FFA and the rodeo committee. It was a lot of fun. And uh, the auction, as it is, was an awful lot of fun too so i hope more people participate next year because it was such a success so but just a, a huge thank you to everybody for making it a success thank you miss morrison uh, mr carney sure yeah i wanted to say uh great job big bang percussion ensemble that was a lot of fun i kind of wish we had a song at the beginning of every meeting yes. <laughs> that was um, also, I wanted to say I had a great time going to the uh, the humble rodeo and barbecue cook-off over the last two weeks, and I wanted to thank all of the volunteers that made that happen. I know that was a pretty monumental undertaking, but it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed going, and I know there was a little bit of drama with one of the uh, bullfighting events, but uh, you know we'll, we'll see if that comes back next year. 
Um, also, I wanted to thank the CBAC volunteers. I know you guys put a lot of time and effort into going through a lot of information. I've got a very large binder right here of the documents you guys are going through. So definitely can appreciate all the, the time and effort you guys put into that, so thank you. We definitely do value your, your feedback and your input. And for all of those that have come and spoken about what we're gonna talk about later, you know, definitely appreciate your input as well. Likewise, for everyone that's contacted us directly via email or phone, you know, we appreciate your input. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Uh, Ms. Dixon? Uh, yeah, I would like to say that to ditto with uh, what Colin said about the Big Bang group, that was really awesome. I would like to start meetings that way as well. Um, I have a few other things. First of all, congratulations to Humble High School's basketball team for their 17-0 and winning streak. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing them in the playoffs. And congratulations to all of the high school swimmers in the district who advanced to the state championship this weekend. I look forward to being in Austin this weekend uh, to, mm -hmm. attend the, to attend the state championship. Um, I enjoyed the Kate Fair. There's been so much going on this month. The Manners Banquets at Timbers and Fall Creek Elementary that I attended, and I and attended my very first Humble Rodeo auction. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, um, but thank you. It's been a great month. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Mr. Lopez? Um, uh, the music in the beginning of the meeting was awesome. Thank you so much for that. I feel like I need a margarita after that many people talk. Awesome. It really was, out yeah, it was outstanding. They, those kids were great. Uh, I can't get over how good they were. Uh, I just want to thank the committee, uh, the bond committee, for getting together um, and, and putting in all that hard work. Um, uh, it, just thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I can tell you that we're going to talk about it uh, a lot tonight, but you got us really close to the finish line as a board, and I really appreciate that as a board member, having to go through that, and, and most of the work was already done. So thank you so much. Those are the comments. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Mr. Sitton. Uh, I will be short and sweet. I'll ditto the things that were said by the other board members. Uh, you know, the rodeo was awesome. Uh, Tracy Bird Saturday night kind of took me back in time um, prior to meeting my wife, I should say. Uh, but anyway, but she's already left. I can say that. So, uh, but uh, but no, it was great. Uh, you know, my colleagues with Edward Jones, we were able to purchase the Grand Champion Hog, so we were glad to give back. the uh, The auction was was incredible as far as the amount of money that was raised for our kids. So, uh, I mean, it was, it was, I don't know what the numbers were. Marley, do you have the numbers? Two seventy. $270,000, folks. I mean, that was given back to the kids. That was a great day. A lot of community partners were out, uh, so very pleased with that. Um, and uh, I'll finish with this. Um, you know, Caitlin coming up like that, that's why I do what I do. You know, she's one of the 41,000 plus students in Humble ISD. And she's the reason I get up in the morning. She's the reason that I go through bond referendums. She's the reason I go through election cycles. Uh, she's the reason that I attend school functions. And uh, because it's, there's 41 other, 41,000 other kids just like her <coughs> out there. And that's why we do what we do. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sitton. Mr. Cunningham? Thank you, Madam President. And I will ditto everything that everybody said. I just want to add two other uh, items. Uh, I had the privilege of last Friday speaking to a group of seniors uh, about uh, what I do as a board member. And uh, it was real nice. They had some real good questions. Some of them were former teachers. And uh, on January 26, I had the pleasure of uh, speaking to, uh, who was in here? Denpack912. 912, Denpack, a little group of Cub Scouts in Eagle Springs. And we talked about building a better world. And so that was a, a, a real good experience, had some real good questions. I think most of those kids were either at uh, Tascosita Springs, I think there was a few at Eagle Springs. But I uh, wanted to just share that with everyone that uh, we've got some great future leaders uh, to look forward to. Uh, that's it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. I, uh, I would only add that, um, again, thank you to the Big Bang. I know how much hours of practice go into that. So I should be thanking the parents probably as well. Um, I, I did see a lot of foot tapping at the, during that time. I, um, and I did say, tell Dr. Fagan, I think those who may be tuning in live may think they have the wrong stream. Uh, <laughs> but that's a good thing. So um, in addition to that, I would just add uh, uh, our appreciation for all of your 
the ways in which the district has reached out to us and showed appreciation for our service during the month of January. Um, none of that goes unnoticed uh, for anything from a simple email to invites to campuses and um, just when we saw you out in person. So thank you for taking the time to help um, us feel appreciated. We certainly did. Um, and then lastly, I would just uh, add to the enjoyment at the barbecue, I would say um, even better than the, the judging of the barbecue, <laughs> which is typically my favorite part, um, I actually love talking to the students who uh, crafted the barbecue pits. Those guys are so passionate. That was amazing. I, I really enjoyed that. Of course, I went home smelling like a sausage, but it was okay. <laughs> All right, um, I don't have anything else to add, so we'll move on to comments by administration. Thank you. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the um, Citizens Bond Advisory Council later when we introduce that item, but I do want to say thank you to everyone. Um, just to put it in perspective, we all had a very interesting August, and then we started um, those meetings in September. And we've moved through the process uh, to this point. We had always planned to start there and move through a process uh, to tonight. And so there's been a lot of great conversation. It's been a quality process. We've had a lot of changes along the way that we've responded to in a very positive manner. Um, I appreciate the, the teamwork of my team uh, who, per, who acted as facilitators of a process and allowed it to, to grow and change over time, as well as all of the people, uh, roughly 100 most nights, who gave of their evenings and, and came together with us to learn about things that maybe are not that exciting to everyone, like bond financing um, and, and facility assessments, but to really understand the needs of this community. And then you fast forward to the month of February and the livestock auction and all of these pieces and parts, and you see once again uh, the Umbel ISD community coming together to support our students. And that is one of the things, uh, one of many things, but a very important thing that makes this district special and a place that is good for, um, for my kids and, and 41,000 and some others. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who volunteered. Uh, we had Portrait of the Graduate last year. We had Bond Committee this year. I hope you're seeing a theme of, of working together for the better uh, interest of the district and putting our students first above all else, uh, asking hard questions, having difficult conversations, moving through, um, and, and not being worried about all of those pieces that sometimes can be intimidating. And I really wanna say, you know, thank you, Jenny, for bringing your students. Um, you know, as a teacher, you have to have a vision for something different, something beyond what we've typically experienced as students. And um, obviously, you had a vision for something a little bit different. You wrote a grant. Uh, you earned that grant through the Umble ISD Foundation. One of the most fabulous things that they do uh, is collect money to fund innovative education grants for teachers. And you saw the result of that here tonight, real learning in an authentic situation. Students who have developed skills that they might not otherwise have because a teacher took a risk and did something a little bit differently and was supported by her school community and also the greater community beyond our walls. So um, that's the theme of our school district and it's a powerful one. It's a place where people want their children because of it. And so thank you for, thank you Jenny for being the, the showcase of that tonight and thank you everyone else for who's here uh, for this very important item that we're going to have a quality discussion about later. Very well. Thank you. Madam President, can I go out of order real quick? Out of order. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, my daughter kind of threw me off. That was I had something that I wanted to say and, and I totally just forgot because I was <coughs> enamored with her. But it's been either 14 or 15 years since a participant from Humble High School has made, it the, has made it to the state swim meet. And this year we have one. And uh, I wanna congratulate Ms. Martina Dixon for her son Alec making it to the state swim meet uh, for the first time in Humble High School uh, in 14 or 15 years, so congratulations. Awesome. Yeah. for going right. out of order and coming back to that, but Thank I you. felt like that needed to be mentioned. Thank you for that addition. Uh, that brings us to item J, 3J, our update from our board associations and committees. We'll start with our audit committee chair, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, board members, you do have a copy of the report uh, for our January uh, activities. Uh, any questions, please see the other audit committees or our internal audit director, Ms. Fashan, 
Board of Superintendent. <laughs> Your next meeting. As a matter of fact, February. yes, we know. February. We will have a meeting uh, this month, February the 27th, 28th. Yeah, we had one and it got moved because we had something more important. It was signing day. So, <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, we, awesome. will have, we will have a meeting on the uh, 28th of uh, February. February. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any? Okay. Uh, our chair, Mr. Lopez of Borden, Superintendent Evaluation Process and Goals Committee. Um, I, I don't have a report, but I mean, you guys know I'm, I'm kind of OCD. And can we just fix Martina's name on the Building and Planning Committee instead of Martin, Martina? Just, it's, it's been bothering me for the last couple of months. Okay, I'm, but no report for that. <laughs> Noted. Our board, Building and Planning Committee Chair, Mr. Sitton. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham, Ms. Dixon, uh, not Martin, but Martina. <laughs> Uh, serve on that committee with me. Uh, you all should have gotten a report from our last meeting, I believe on Friday. Uh, a couple highlights, uh, we got an update on Middle School 9, uh, which is now, we need to change that to say Westlake Middle School. Uh, uh, we got an update on Kingwood High School, everything's still going as planned. Fingers crossed, March 18th, right? 19th. 19th. Well, we can start on Sunday. <laughs> we can have a prayer session, you know? But uh, there's, uh, there's a few items that are uh, agenda items, so I won't hit those. If uh, uh, you'll see the information here, if you want to discuss it further, we can do that uh, as well. Uh, we looked at uh, the elementary school number 29 land purchase, that's a, an item. Um, uh, we're doing some due diligence on a couple of pieces of property that's in there. And let's see, um, I think that's really about it on the highlights, but uh, you've got the agenda, uh, or the agenda that we use, so if you have any questions, let us know. I do just have a, and I don't know if you can answer it now, but um, on the spreadsheet of the differences in the land for the different locations, Yes. The one at Lakewood Pines, uh, the amount there doesn't match the purchase amount. Is that not a purchase amount? That's just a transfer. Is that, that's why that's different? Okay. That's all. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, and you're done, so. Yeah, that's it. Let me go back to the agenda. All right, that brings us to our Education Foundation liaison. Liaison. Mr. Colin Carney. That's me. So the, I mentioned this earlier, but the foundation wanted, wants to thank uh, everyone that came out to the Humble Barbecue Cook-Off and Rodeo. We had a great two weekends for the community, and it wouldn't have happened without the support of all the sponsors and many of the volunteers, and all the people with the Humble Rodeo Committee specifically that put in lots of, many, many months of, of hard work to make sure that that was a very successful event. So thank you to everyone, all the sponsors and volunteers for making that a great two weekend event. Um, as a reminder, as Dr. Fagan mentioned this earlier, the proceeds for the <coughs> events benefit the Humble Education Foundation's Innovative Education Grant Program. So we just saw one of those Innovative Education Grants in action, so it was good to see that timely. Uh, um, Humble ISD teachers submit their innovative ideas to engage students in learning, and because of community support of the cook-off and rodeo, the foundation can provide the money so that these ideas come to life. <coughs> just a reminder, the Innovative Education Grants are due, the applications are due this Friday, February 23rd. I believe that's 10 days from now. And you can submit your grant online at humbleisdfoundation.org. Thank you. Can board members submit grants? <laughs> All right. Uh, Finance Committee, Mr. Sitton. Uh, most everything that uh, we talked about, they're all agenda items. So there's a few items that will be pulled here in a minute. Staff and they all ask questions for them. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And our Kingwood Super Neighborhood Council representative, Ms. Martina Dixon. Uh, nothing to report. The meeting was canceled due to the snow. <laughs> when does that happen? <laughs> the next meeting is February 21st. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank you. And Legislative Committee. Okay. Uh, I went to the uh, Region 4 Grassroots Advocacy TASB um, committee meeting uh, last week. Uh, 
And for those of you in the audience, TASB is Texas Association of School Boards, and we sit in Region 4. And so the purpose of the meeting, which uh, all committee members have highlights of the legislation that was passed in our last volume and what uh, TASB's advocacy points were and were they met and were they not met in, in the bills that were passed. So it was our job to start the process of setting up the priorities for Region 4 in our next legislative session, So, which came out to be school finance, uh, basically fixing the financial system. And hopefully, uh, some way, if the state of Texas will fix our system to get us what we need. And then local control was the second priority. Uh, giving school boards control of their districts. And then Harvey Relief is the third one. Uh, the A through F accountability, we know it's going to be there, but, and we know that it's been tweaked, but, you know, and then, of course, what will it look like in the future and, and really devising it in, more, in a more appropriate manner. And then, last but not least, TRS Care and TRS Active Care, if all of you know, it right now there is a big discussion that they will be going back to the legislature for more money uh, due to insurance cost. So, but I, I want to thank member Mr. Cunningham. Uh, I will be part of that committee and, I, when, uh, and we will go and we will meet in April when, at, in San Antonio with all the other districts in the state of Texas, working on, because we refine it down to four points, four discussion points uh, before we go to the legislature. Okay. I just want to expand on that a little bit too. Ms. Morrison was chosen as one of our representatives to the LAC as our Legislative Action Committee, is that right? Advisory Committee. Advisory committee. Yes. And so they are responsible for representing mm -hmm. our, our districts in our area and then who ultimately uh, bring that information to your Board of Directors, is that right, Mr. S Mr. Cunningham? Uh, right, a group of them will be chosen to be uh, to serve on the, uh, the Legislative Committee for TASB and they will bring <laughs> Awesome, I think that's great, I just wanna point out Two, for those that are not active legislatively, but maybe you are in your own groups, I, I, I'm still learning how it all works. But it's good to, to let us, but especially Nancy know and Mr. Cunningham, how proposed bills will affect your, your teacher group, your whatever group, because they are there arguing on your behalf, they are determining what these priorities are, and if they can understand from your perspective how that TRS bill will affect you directly that helps her to be more of an advocate on your behalf. And if I may, uh, Madam President, uh, Ms. Morrison, uh, Region 4 is combined of 50 school districts. 50 school districts. So, and so Ms. Morrison is, is the representative for uh, the 50 school districts. And I'm learning, same as everybody else, but what I will tell you is we were fortunate enough to listen to a lot of legislatures at that meeting. Mm -hmm. Is that fortunate? <laughs> well, that's true, or unfortunate, whichever way you want to say it. But what we did hear consistently <clears throat> was that the one thing that does touch their hearts is that if they're communicated with by every con constituent, mm -hmm. not just one person, but everybody, it seems to pull at their heartstrings because that's their voter base. So it is very, very important that we all take part. So more to come on that, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next, we'll move on to our consent agenda. And for those of you who don't know, a consent agenda is basically a practice that groups this routine business and reports into one agenda item. Helps us to kind of approve all of that in one action rather than filing motions on each item separately. So uh, we'll get started and note any items that may be pulled, uh, beginning with our minutes. Paul. Oh. Hold on, I didn't get mine out. Excuse me, just a minute. All right, minutes is a pull. The so next is the tax refunds. Uh, item C, budget transfers and amendments. 
Item D, budget transfers and amendments related to the 2008 bond fund capital projects. Item E, ratify and approve the application for FEMA Public Assistance Alternative Procedures Pilot mm -hmm. Program. Oh. That's a pool. <clears throat> Item F, property insurance. Item G, purchases exceeding 50,000 in the aggregate or 25,000 individual. Oh. Um, item H, goods, professional services, and non-construction services exceeding 50,000 in the aggregate or 25,000 individual. Um, item I, resolution to declare a public purpose regarding certain actions related to a closure of all district facilities for inclement weather days. Okay, item J, consideration of guaranteed maximum pricing for the Welcome Center renovation and Hurricane Harvey remediation. Oh. Item J is pulled. Item K, consideration of temporary lease at Kingwood Place for displaced special education and curriculum and instruction personnel. Item L, negotiations and purchase of real property located at Lakewood Pines. Uh, pull that. Pull item, pull 4L. Item 4M, approval of vendor for election equipment and supplies. Item N, adoption of the district calendar for the 2018-19 school year. Pull. We'll pull in item N. All right, we'll read that back as a motion. Uh, Madam President, I move the board approve the following items by consent. Items 4B, 4C, 4D, 4F, 4H, 4I, 4K, 4M, and that's it. All right. Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? That motion passes. We will go back to those items that were pulled, beginning with item 4A, the approval of minutes. And I believe that was Ms. Dixon. I just have a minor correction. Uh, the super name. Oh. A motion in a second. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> a minor correction to the minutes. Um, the super neighborhood council meeting that was canceled was scheduled for January 17th rather than January 27th, which is stated in the minutes. Thank you. All right, we have the correction noted. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Was that it? I just had a different thing. Uh, Can I ask a quick question? Um, related to that? On the, yeah. Related to the minutes, oh, yes. Okay. Um, I've got a, a note here that if the minutes are pulled to read it in a certain manner, are we legal with the way we did that? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Parliamentary. We'll move on to 4E. Uh, is that right? Uh, ratify and approve the application for FEMA Public Assistance Alternative Procedures Pilot Program. Mr. Sitton. Oh, I have a motion. Do I need a second? Second. Motion and second. Discussion? All right. So, yes, I did pull that. Uh, uh, just so everyone and all the board members are, are kind of versed on what this is. Uh, I want to uh, defer to uh, Nolan or, or Mike on the FEMA program. And one of y'all kind of explain what we're doing here and, and, and why and how it benefits us and so forth. I know I caught you off guard. I apologize. Let me call Corey Spalding or Shelly. Um, just, yeah, just a quick overview of that. Uh, uh, I'm, f I'm fully prepared to vote, but I, wanna, I want, want y'all to explain it a little bit. Good evening. That's all right. Good evening. Um, in summary form, this program is um, slightly different than the traditional submission of project worksheet by project worksheet for all your different categories that FEMA will uh, support for funding. And um, we've been working very closely with our consultants, DRS. There are FEMA, FEMA and insurance consultants, and they identified very early on that Kingwood High School, with that having such um, significant damage and being such a large project and all the details, as you can imagine, that are going into putting that back, that it would be a very good um, selection for this type, for the, for the pilot program. And the pilot program, what it affords us essentially is 
we come up with a fixed cost estimate for the permanent repairs only. This doesn't include all the emergency work done by BMS or all the contents. But uh, what you do is you work closely with your architects and all of your uh, contractors as you're moving along, estimating all of the damages, all the things that need to be repaired, and you come up with a fixed cost estimate that you work with FEMA on and negotiate with them. And uh, if you can agree to that estimate, then that's basically your project budget for that. And so what we've, what we've tried to do is, uh, you know, We've been, we've been gathering these costs as we're moving along very quickly um, with our target date of March 19th moving in. So we've got a, a, a really good sense of where we are currently and what's left to do. And so we feel really confident about the number that we put in here for you tonight. Um, that number um, is, the, is at a minimum what we'll be asking for. We're kind of firming up some, some other things, some mitigation work, those kinds of things um, within the next 10 business days. But um, essentially, we, will, we would agree to that number, and um, instead of having to submit project worksheet by project worksheet, that number, once it's agreed to, that is given to the state as the um, recipient of the grant from FEMA, and then we're the sub-recipient, and we can draw down from that amount that we're agreed to, rather than having to submit all of our final cost and invoice and have to wait for payment until everything gets to the end. And the um, really nice thing about that is uh, if we have any money left over from that, we don't have to give that back. We can use that for further mitigation projects for Kingwood High School that would help us prevent damages such as what we've experienced um, from happening again, try to mitigate those costs. So in summary, uh, it's, it, we, we can get our money faster, which is a good thing. Um, and it's just a more comprehensive way to go about it uh, than just have to submit for, you know, emergency work and permanent work and um, just all the various categories, project worksheet by project worksheet, and watching those all go through the very lengthy system that they have to go through. So basically, if I understand it correctly, and the way we talked about it in building planning, that instead of itemizing the work and turning in receipts and all that stuff to FEMA, it's a negotiated process once we negotiate that number with FEMA, uh, it, we, we just go from there. That's our number, yes. I mean, we do have to support all those costs, right. but that has all kind of been built into the estimate. And there's, there's that work, but it, the work is, is more efficient. We can more efficiently turn that into them because we've kind of handled all of that on the front end rather than just as, as we go. Yeah. Thank so you. That was my question was, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you give us confidence in that estimate? <laughs> well, um, what I will tell you is that um, we've got a lot of really high-level people working on it, and we've got DRS, they're working hand-in-hand -hand with PBK, our architects out there. They're out there every day with the contractors coming along behind them, communicating, collaborating on that number. So um, our, our number at this point is, is we've been building it as we go, and being where we are in the project, we're very confident that we've got our arms around. We don't have any, any real surprises out there because everything's been looked at, dug into at this point. You, yeah, you've done a walkthrough with FEMA yes. as well, right? Yes, okay. FEMA came out for a site visit in November. Of course, we're much further along. You know, they, they could only look at what they could see and at that point, we, we didn't have everything torn out at that point, so we've, we've, they, they have an idea of, of the damages, and we're working with, they've developed the scope, we've come along and developed our own scope behind them, we've had our own estimators in there, and so we're marrying all of that up to get to a really solid number. So yeah, so that's what we talked about in building and planning, is, is how, how accurate can we make that number, and when you think about it, we're gonna open that school in March, and, and so most of that work is already done, uh, so we started before we had any any idea what we were getting from FEMA or from the state, which we still don't really know what we're getting from FEMA and the state, even though there's still people out there saying we've been guaranteed money. We haven't been guaranteed squat, other than what we got back from the insurance company. So we're, we've got about $30 million in, uh, $100 million worth of expenses. But when you look at the work that's been done and what has what's left to be done, it's a lot easier to to estimate the work that's left to be done because the vast majority has already, already happened. So uh, should be fairly easy, I think, to come to some agreement on uh, within some parameters on that big number. Uh, but the big thing was good opportunity. It's a pilot program. It's a good opportunity for us to get our money quicker uh, if, if we can come to a negotiated number that's, 
sufficient for us and for FEMA. And, and as a point of final point of clarification, we'll be making an application of the receiving number which we believe is correct and covers us. Um, if FEMA does not agree to that number or we don't agree to a negotiated number, then we'll fall back on the traditional method of submitting invoices as, as we go. Perfect. Uh, Perfect. So I just didn't want the board to think this was a done deal. Um, we have high hopes for it. We have, the, the board has authorized us to involve the very best experts we could possibly find in developing and making this application. Uh, we feel like we're the poster child for people that people should come to agreement with, but it isn't done until it's done, and, and we'll let you know in the next couple of meetings, hopefully, uh, if we're coming to agreement with you. And just one other point of a clarification. This is the the building only, you said. So the, the uh, permanent the remediation work, work and the contents, and that'll be filed. That'll all go through the traditional project worksheet. And we, we're, we're working on those things concurrently, but this piece is just for the permanent build back. Any other questions? All right. I'll, I'll throw one out there real quick. Um, I know one of the main benefits of this program is speed of recovery of our costs. Do we have any idea as to how quickly we can expect that if this is successful, we could get our money back? I know, I know we just received a payment on Hurricane Ike 10 years ago. Yes. So, <laughs> just any ideas? The, the answer is we really don't. They call this a pilot program, uh, but it's been out there for a number of years. years they, it started with Superstorm Sam. 2013, Sam. Yeah. So, so it's, pilot program is not a great, Other questions? All right. Uh, those in favor of supporting the recommendation from administration? Unanimous. All right. The next item for discussion is 4G purchases exceeding related to Excel communications. So moved. Second. Uh, yeah, I'll pull that real quick. Uh, we've been talking a lot in uh, building and planning about. Uh, efficiencies and coordination and the way that you know for years it's it we, we use different processes or different um, different technology I mean you used to handle the technology committee as well uh, but uh, trying to streamline things a little bit better and this is one I just wanted to point out this is one opportunity uh, where uh, the team has looked at an opportunity with new schools coming online with Kingwood High School being redone uh, to streamline more efficiently the uh, security system uh, that we're using and going with uh, a single vendor here uh, for uh, best price, best price, best value. Questions? All right, those in favor? Passes. All right, item 4J, I believe. Uh, consider uh, for the Welcome Center renovation and Hurricane Harvey remediation. Um, I have a motion. So moved. And second. Second. Motion seconded by Ms. Dixon. Um, that Mr. Sitton, did you pull that? Yes. Uh, I pulled that as well. Last month, uh, uh, as you may remember, that we approved Anslow Bryant as the uh, CM at risk uh, mm -hmm. vendor for the Welcome Center. Uh, this is coming back to you with the not to exceed dollar figure to approve. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Other discussion? Those in favor? 
And uh, last one in consent, we're circling back on item L, negotiations and purchase of real property at Lakewood Pines. We have a motion. So moved. And a second, second, Ms. Dixon. Uh, Hold Ms. that one as Mr. well. Sitton. And uh, you, you, you kind of asked a, a question earlier. Uh, in your packet, uh, <coughs> you saw that some of the, the different properties we were looking at and going back and forth on. This is the property we've been working on for quite some time that I've been promising you were coming with a recommendation. Uh, it's uh, in the same subdivision, but it's moved over to a different part of the subdivision. Uh, and we're in the middle of the due diligence on that as well. Uh, but uh, early indications are we're not going to have any of the issues that uh, that were perceived on the other piece of property in the subdivision. So we're going to move forward. All right. We have a motion and second. Those in favor? Lakewood Pines. All right, that brings us to our next item of business is item 5A, our action items order calling bond election on May 4 in. What I did? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that is kind of important. <laughs> Adoption of the district calendar. Uh, need a motion? So and a second? Second. Second, Ms. Morrison and Ms. I didn't pull this one. I pulled this one. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Dixon, you have the floor. Okay, to my colleagues on the dais, when you look at the survey results at first glance, it seems if, as if the majority of the respondents prefer calendar option A. However, statistically speaking, when you have three options, the results are essentially skewed. We have 47% for option A, 40% for option B, 13% for option C, with the primary difference of the calendars being the start and finish dates of each. With these percentages, we must make the assumption that 53%, the 40 plus the 13, of respondents do not want to start school on the earlier date in option A. Therefore, I feel as a board, we should go with the happy medium of option B. To get sound numbers from respondents, the only other option would be to send out a second survey to narrow it down to two options, where it is safe to say that 13 where it is safe to say that the 13 percent who wanted option C would invariably select option B, making the final result, result the same, option B. And then going forward, I would like to respectfully request that the administration shortens the time span for the calendar survey, especially if the survey has three or more options. Doing so would allow a second survey mm -hmm. to be sent out with the final two options, which would give us a better sample of data to work with when we make these types of decisions. Good points. Any other discussion? So Questions? I'm looking at option A, and that's got a start date of the 20th. Mm -hmm. Right. Option C has a start date of the 27th. Mm -hmm. It's and option three. Three. Well, three. three. Okay. And option B is the 27th. <coughs> so you're recommending we go with option B? The one in the middle. The yes. The one that starts on the 22nd instead of the 20th or the 27th. Correct. But you're making the assumption that just because they voted differently, they wouldn't vote for A after. Right, because option three, I said C, but three, that is the latest start date, which would be the last Monday in August. So I would reasonably assume that those people who, uh, the respondents of the survey, if they were to vote a second time, they wouldn't choose the earlier date, they would choose the date in the middle. But there's other differences in the calendar. The second semester begins on different dates under right. option one versus two and three. Could well, yeah. that, that's true, but I feel most of the discussion around the calendars is the start date and finish date. Well, there was, there was some, other, some other differences. Um, I, one, I, I spoke to a teacher like the additional day in October in option one as well. And I've heard that as well. And you go in some dates to give them <coughs> days without kids where they can do professional development 
And that's, that's what they do with those two days that we push back, is that you have uh, two additional uh, development days. And um, so I've talked to some teachers that they like that. <coughs> because, you know, the weather getting so crazy, we lose our inclement weather days. And so this, this basically bakes in days that they will definitely have for development, full days. And while that is also true, the other, the other issue is when you back into the calendar, if your kid is involved in, I don't know, I'll just use orchestra for example. On campus you have mandatory orchestra camp, so you're backing up even further into, this, into August. So, I don't know, I just feel like the, the option two is kind of a happy medium, or is there enough time to send out a second survey with the top two options. Well, we did have a, uh, there was a first, so that's, there was a previous survey that wasn't calendar specific, but it asked for preferences, right? right. That is correct. So we, had, we, okay. we had the very first survey at the start of this process, and we sent out to help guide our work as a committee. Right. Um, the, the, the question was, your preferences for starting August 20th, August 22nd, or August 27th, 64 out of 10,393 responses, 64.5% chose, no, this is the first survey, chose August 20th. And then 15% uh, chose the 22nd, and 20%, 20.4% chose August 27th. Now that was the very beginning, you know, we threw out what we like, so right. we, you know, as we were developing calendars, because if it came back, we don't, we don't want to start for the 27th. Right. But that's not what we received, so that's why we explored the disciplinary option. It says 40% rated ending school in May as their highest priority, so that. Okay. And but is that covered in option A and option I mean, option one and two? Correct. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, I voted for option two. And then I spoke to some teachers, and they convinced me that option one was the way to go. But I'd already voted. So, but when I saw this, when I saw this came out at forty-seven percent, I said, I think a lot of teachers voted for it. Well, I mean, because you say I, that, we have eighteen percent. But I think too. I mean, I spoke to a lot of teachers too, and I think a lot of it has to do with too. They like to end out before June, right? Because we've got a lot of seniors that are going off to summer school at their colleges, and they and they they need that time and span. So I mean, it's. I so that know. I mean that definitely takes option three out of running. Is there any other discussion, questions? Uh, you're welcome to make a motion to amend. to amend the recommendation if you want to change anything about the recommendation. The recommendation currently reads, the recommendation okay, well. curr it currently reads, superintendent recommends the Board of Trustees approve calendar option one for the 2018-19 school year. Madam President. I move we amend the motion to select calendar option two for the district calendar for the 2018-2019 school year rather than option one. So there's a motion and a second, so it, it's upheld, so we'll have to vote. Uh, those in favor of changing the words option one, amending the motion to change the words option one to option two. Those in favor? Those opposed? So the amendment fails. So the original motion is to adopt option one. I uh, need a vote on that. So those in favor of option one. Um, opposed? <laughs> no abstentions. That's everybody, right? I think, um, the, just to square the circle, I think Martina's suggestion is probably a correct one. Maybe that we should start the process earlier and, and just, just talk about how we do it next year to more data. That's a good idea. And, and I want to add to that because it's not part of the discussion of that particular item, but I, 
If you're in the audience or you're watching from home, someone sent me an email dealing with the Forney ISD calendar again, and, and I deleted it by accident. And so I never got back to them. They had some specific questions though that really sparked some some idea that would solve this issue too, because they, I believe the way the email read, they actually have adopted a two-year calendar instead of a one-year calendar uh, for planning purposes and so forth. So that really sparked some interest in me, and I went back to respond, and it was not there. So we did forward that to the administration, so they okay. have that. Okay, perfect, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So uh, if you're watching, I apologize. I meant to respond, and I deleted your email. So. Some of that we have to be taken to the district innovation committee or right exactly we have the ability to look at that but but <clears throat> solve some of these issues as well so. all right all right moving on to item now we're at item 5a order calling bond election on may 5th um, before we call for a motion i do just want to quickly turn it over to the administration for maybe a quick overview recap <clears throat> sure thank you um as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are we have worked our way to this evening on uh, this bond question. Um, I just wanted to sort of rehash where we've been for everybody in the audience, and then uh, of course turn it over to the the board of trustees for their conversation on uh, where they would like to go. So. You all probably remember we did a, a facilities assessment. It's the 2017 facilities assessment. And after that was completed, uh, we brought forward um, the bond committee, which was open to absolutely anyone uh, in our community and had a lot of participation in that starting in September and working our way through the process till now. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Rick Bland from PBK Architects to just go over the process, a couple of things, how the facility assessment was created, and also uh, there have been some <coughs> questions about um, how the, the idea of uh, renovating a building versus reconstructing a building, how we do that analysis and determine which is the right path for the district, and I think it would be helpful for everyone to just have a brief review of that piece. Uh, and then we'll move right into the, the matrix, which is what our committees use to really generate uh, a bond package that they work from. And so we have a, a live matrix ready to go in the event that the board would like to do uh, that same process and see what it comes up with. But first we'd like to just do a brief review of how the facility assessment was created and also the idea behind Lakeland Elementary and Kingwood Middle School. So, Rick Bland. Great. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. Madam President, trustees, and Dr. Fagan, thank you for uh, allowing us to be a part of this presentation tonight in this um, historic mm -hmm. um, evening for Umbel ISD. Tonight we're going to do a, uh, um, a rehash of a presentation we did in June um, and just go through the, the assessment um, 500 page assessment we're gonna we're gonna start with page one and no, no, uh, in June we did a re, we did a more detailed review of this assessment and talked about every chapter tonight we're gonna just briefly go over some of the discussion that we talked about in June and how does assessment um, how does it start who's involved what kind of transparency is involved and, and uh, who is included in the assessment. If you see that the wheel up on the, on the screen there, you see that we have not only architects and consultants and engineers, they of course need to be part of an assessment of, of physical buildings, but we also have UMBL um, ISD department heads. So part of our assessment team is UMBL ISD apartment, department heads, the maintenance staff, uh, facility staff, uh, technology and life safety staff, um, also um, um, uh, security and transportation. Every department staff within the district is consulted in some way or another as we work through this assessment. Some of the things we start with are their previous records as well. So maintenance records, life cycle um, schedules of materials, and then also we hit um, campus, every one of the campuses, and we issue um, online interview we do on, online interviews with principals every principal we use a in 2016 we actually presented a um, utilization and unifier study to the board so that's also one of the tools that were put into this into this binder and then also the demographics i'm going to talk about that in just a second so we start out with walking every facility and meeting with every principal and and having questionnaire uh, discussions with principals we also give them online questionnaire so they can do fill out this this information at their own pace or uh, uh, delegate it to somebody else on their staff some of the sites we walked we walked with many people within the within the uh, 
facility, whether it's principal, assistant principal, or other people on the staff. So the binder is about 5,000 items. We've talked um, earlier about this being a living and breathing document that has to change as items are completed or things happen. Dr. Fagan mentioned earlier about we had an exciting August and, and kind of um, caused us to kind of pause and look at the assessment again and look at Kingwood High School and make some quick adjustments to Kingwood High School assessment sheets. Because of the, the way the assessment is put together and the database that, that we have on all the assessment items, it allowed us to very quickly go into Kingwood High School items that we discussed last time when we were here and take some of those out that are now part of the restoration project. So we, as I mentioned, we do the online questionnaires. We do, the, we do that through SurveyMonkey as well as the uh, live interviews. Uh, we, we visit with um, um, all the departments that you see on the screen there. We ended up with about 110 meetings at this point. We're still, I think we're still counting, and about 550 hours of uh, either site visits, walks, or meetings. The binder actually uh, starts out with just a little bit of a history of Fumble ISD. This is just if somebody picks up the binder is new to the district and, uh, and has a little bit of a um, history lesson of the district and the culture of, of Humble. Uh, the Humble area. Findings and directions is a chapter that's really just an um, executive summary of some of the things that I'm going to talk about in just a second. These are uh, whether there's an, um, um, classroom additions identified in some of the campuses or whether there are uh, major renovations or replacements as Dr. Fagan uh, mentioned. Demographics and capacities. So if you have a, a long range master plan, one of the things that really drives a master plan is the demographics and the growth of a district. So if you have a, if you have a plan, if it's a valid plan, the growth of the district is, sets the velocity and the speed of how you execute that plan. This is the information that we use to decide whether or not a new facility is needed, and it's based on capacity, it's based on growth of each facility, and then also um, um, whether or not a new facility is needed in the same planning area or the planning zone as described by Pat Guzman in the PASA report. The next two sections, and I'm going to get into these a little bit more detail, is the new schools and uh, major projects. You heard a lot about major projects, and then you also heard a lot about uh, facility um, condition assessments and priorities. I'm going to talk about priorities in just a second. There is always a lot of discussion about an assessment and cost. Cost of facilities, cost of replacement costs, cost of individual items. We have an extensive database of um, uh, cost database of not only our projects, but also other architects within the area. You'll see joiner uh, projects on this list and other architects and also some of your projects. This just helps us keep a track on where the market is as far as construction costs. So as we move through, this has been a two-year process, and as we move through our first walks all the way to tonight, we are always looking at construction costs. We're looking at inflation. You may have heard that um, halfway through um, the uh, bond planning committee's meetings, we adjusted the inflation. So the inflation, we actually brought it down from what we originally thought it might be about this time, and that was a, a snapshot two years from now. So we even said at that time, these sheets that you see on the screen are the sheets from the June presentation we did, and the inflation was actually a little bit higher at that time. So as we worked through and we're monitoring the market through the cost database and through what's going on in the current construction market, we are allowed to, or uh, we have the opportunity to pull these inflation rates down and actually reduce some of the construction costs, which did happen in this case. Doesn't always happen. Sometimes it actually goes up. We're fortunate this time that it actually did lower. Um, one of the ways, you're going to have some discussion tonight, I am sure, about the priority ones, priority two, 2.1s, and 2.2s. The way we get to that when we, when we walk these facilities, so we've, we've got the demographics, we know if we need new schools, we know the cost of components in, in schools and new projects. Now we're walking facilities. How do you document those facilities and all those thousands, we have 5,000 items, I believe it is, on the, in the assessment. How do you document those in a database format that can be quickly accessed later and then also adjusted, as I mentioned the story about Kingwood High School, how can you um, track all those items, quickly find them within the 5,000 item database, delete those or analyze those whether or not they need to be deleted. You're going to hear about party ones, party twos, and threes. Most of the discussion tonight will most likely be around party ones and twos, and that is the case that is the case in most districts that we work in and most bond plans, it always focuses on party ones and twos. Party ones are mainly about the must-do items, the legal items, the code, there's code changes that happened since the last bond, uh, bond program or, or as facilities age, age, there's always code changes. There's also reasons for 
uh, priority one items that are based on life cycle costs. So there's code items and must do items. At the same time, you may have a priority one that's not a code item, but it is an item that's about to fail. So the maintenance department, Kenny and his, his great staff may have identified chillers somewhere. They're in a priority one because they are at the end of their life cycle. They're not there because it's a code item. Priority twos are also should do items, instructional items and program needs but they are also a life cycle of a three to five year range. So as we move through this plan, we, because of the space between the bond programs, there are a lot of priority twos that were discovered. So as we move through the, program, uh, through the priority two items and we realize the number of priority twos, and also when you see the three to five year range and the number of items, we decided as a group to break those up into priority one, 2.1s and 2.2s. So the 2.1s will either be the ones that are identified by the staff as the most needed items or the ones that really affect program needs, or they're at the front end of the life cycle expectancy of the three to five range. So they would fall in the, in the three to four to three and a half range, and then the three, uh, the 2.2s then are in the four and five year range. So that's how we came about dividing up the twos and ones for, for the committee to look at as, as uh, separate groups of uh, priority items. So the rest of the assessment is, this is really the bulk of the assessment. It's a three and a half inch binder or so. Every campus has a, uh, a cover page, information page, and then the real meat of the assessment are these items which are taking every single item, applying a cost that we just talked about to it, applying a priority code that we talked about. So now we have priority codes, we have rankings, and we, we know where to find these within the, within the facility. They're all ranked as far as if they're, if they're a CTE item, if they're a roofing item, if they're a landscape, or if they're an athletic item. This just gives a committee and this board an opportunity to quickly look at the items and not have to get into the detail of every one of these items it would be a long night if you're going to go through 5,000 items. So the, the committee and, or the, the facilities department and, and um, maintenance department has done that work as far as the prioritization. Um, what happens when, and when we go through these assessments are there are other items that are identified as we're walking with principals or interviewing principals, there are what we call major project items that also, also kind of rise to the top. These aren't individual uh, scope items and priority items, they are actually like this item, which is the uh, third practice gyms at the high schools. So there are several major project items that you've heard a lot about also when the committee presented, and I'm sure some of those will be uh, identified or discussed tonight also. But these are items that were worthy of being pulled out and identified as a standalone project. Additionally to that, as we walk through some of these facilities and we have a numerous number of priority ones and twos for one particular facility, we start to look at a facility for a replacement candidate. Now, when you look at a facility for a replacement candidate, there many people would walk facilities and probably and think probably there's 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 numerous replacement candidates out there. Well, at some point you have to you have to benchmark the facilities and, and decide which ones are really rising to the top and which ones are are more of a candidate. There's a tool that we use called the facility condition index. All that is doing is taking all these priority ones, twos, and, and threes and fours. We take those at a different percentage, but you take those in as a proportion to the cost of a new facility or replacement facility. So when we look at an FCI of a building and an FCI is approaching above 60% or 60%, another way to look at it is all of the maintenance items, all the additions that were discovered are needed for that particular site. There may be additions because the classrooms are too small. The library may be too small. At the same time, there may be a numerous number of priority ones of life cycle issues or code issues and you weigh those against the replacement cost. If you're getting north of 60% of the cost of a replacement of a building, you start to think about, well, should I build, should I put more money into this building and we still have areas of the building, whether it is the admin areas or classroom or educational appropriateness of the building, whether they are still suffering and you're still taking care of all of the maintenance items, you're taking care of maybe some capacity issues, but you're still not quite happy with that building, what point do you decide to build a new building? That is the study of the FCI. So as we work through FCI studies, uh, most uh, all the facilities are ranked with an FCI. And we often get the question of why is, a, why is one facility that's actually older than another facility not your, your candidate or a higher FCI and your candidate for replacement? 
One of those reasons is because Kenny's group has replaced, just done a major renovation, just replaced all the chillers, just replaced, took down all the ceilings, replaced all the piping and duct work and all the air handler units. Well, that lowers the FCI proportion now compared to the new facility cost. So now you've already spent that much money previously, uh, either in a previous bond or, or other uh, uh, work items previously. And now your spread is a little bit, your spread's a little bit higher for, or a little bit bigger from your replacement cost to the maintenance cost that we've identified. Inversely of that though also you can have a newer building that, or, or an older building that the educational appropriateness, the size of the classrooms, the administrative space areas, the special programs that are within the facility, they can also increase an FCI. So there, there are two things at play there and it's just a, it's a study of replacement costs versus cost that needs to go into a facility, and they're not always based on the age of the facility. It's also based on whether or not that facility has had recent renovations or even the size of the building, the size of classrooms. So that is one reason why Lakeland Elementary has risen to the top and also Kingwood Middle School has risen to the top as a uh, candidate for replacement. Yes, there are other facilities that are not too far behind that. Uh, but at some point, you have to decide which ones, um, which ones are the highest candidates with the highest needs and then prioritize. And that's all the FCI study really does. So that leads into, so now we've done demographics, we've done um, new schools, we've done major projects, we've identified major projects, we've identified candidates for replacement, which are also major projects as well. And we have identified all of the priority ones, twos, 2.1s, 2.2s across the board to the right. That allows us to put all of this into a matrix, and this is what the committee used for eight, eight meetings to review um, um, all the way down to two proposals, which you heard last month. So I believe the rest of the evening is about the, um, the matrix and looking at the matrix, and if you have any questions about what I just discussed, uh, please. I just have one clarification was about the, oh, the uh, Kingwood High School items. You said um, those have been removed from this? They have been removed from the, from the assessment. So as those items moved into restoration items and put back items, they've come out of the assessment. Thank you. And what we've actually done to track those also, this is for, we want the assessment also be a historical, a historical document. We've actually, if you look at the current assessment online, you'll see strike throughs. Okay. So even some of those items were, maybe there was an item that wasn't completely done, it was a door replacement. We had to replace doors on the first and second level, the split level, we didn't have to do the other levels. So you might see a strike through on the door item for replacing doors and hardware, however we didn't take all of it out. So we had to leave some of it in for future, um, uh, future consideration. Sure, now was that to take into the matrix level for committee consideration? That was. It's, it's, okay, yeah. okay, thank you. That's it. Others clarify? Thank you. Thank you. So now we would like to, um, I believe Carrie is going to um, be a support to the board as uh, if you would like to use the live matrix uh, as part of your conversation, certainly an option. Um, and she's very familiar with the matrix because uh, she has supported us uh, throughout the bond committee process and supported the groups who have um, actually said take this in, put that out, whatever. So what we've done is we've populated a matrix with so the- The matrix that she has is unlocked? Her, um. <laughs> <laughs> what I had was locked, so I couldn't play with it. So I had to use, I had to make my own. You have matrix. to know the secret. <laughs> okay. Had to copy and paste over, did you? I had lots of yeah. equal sums in my, uh, my own <laughs> matrix there. The, the matrix is very uh, interesting because as you add certain things, it takes other things out. So that might have been a challenge for you, Mr. Lopez. But in any case, um, the Take more time. I, I'm, I'm did you dedicated. did you figure all that out? Uh, oh yeah. That's impressive. Um, so in any case, I would like to present the matrix that we've started with. <laughs> is the one uh, I believe that has all the items that were agreed to uh, by most folks on the bond committee and then um, happy to have the board discuss from there. Okay, we appreciate that background. Now before we take a motion, uh, first I wanna also thank everyone who has served in any capacity on the bond committee, as well as provided support to the bond committee, whether it's our administrative teams and so forth, mm -hmm. and then also been responsive to our uh, committee members. 
in their requests um, for updating that. So certainly your advice is uh, helpful as we go through this process. So we just wanted to make sure to let you know how valuable that is to us in making this decision. So thank you. Uh, procedurally, we will, um, there's not, the recommendation is to approve the, the order calling for the bond. To do that, we need an amount to approve. So that's what our discussion will be about this evening. Um, and to have that discussion, we have to have a motion on the floor. So we'll have our parliamentarian make a motion, which uh, following a second, we'll be able to have discussion, um, possibly make amendments and what have you. So that's how it work. We'll call for a motion then. Yes, Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve the order calling the bond election recommended by administration in the amount of $600 million. <laughs> do I have a second? Second. All right, I have a motion seconded by Mr. Lopez. Um, the motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, we'll begin our discussion. Um, Mr. Sitton made the motion, so we'll let you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, just a few comments, uh, and then we'll get into the actual numbers and so forth. Uh, we, I think we've all have gone through the, the metrics, and we've played with it. We've looked at different scenarios and so forth. Uh, I want to commend the Citizens bond, Citizen Bond Advisory Committee for the work you did and all the meetings that you went to, the amount of data you had to go through. Um, I want to, to also look at some of the data that, that came out and some of the speakers that came out, and then I'm going to make a comment on that uh, and then turn it back over to you, Madam President, if that's all right. So uh, as was mentioned earlier, the, in November the 16th, um, the vote was taken at that point in time when there were eight groups. Um, and at that point in time, four of the eight groups voted in favor of the natatorium. Uh, no one voted uh, to add money to career and technology, and no one voted to add any money to the emergency operations center at that time. Um, on December 4th, another vote was taken as those groups went from eight to four. Three of the four groups voted in favor of the natatorium at that time. Uh, again, no money was added to CTE and no money was added to the Emergency Operations Center and security. On December 14th, as we look through the two groups, you had the LGI group and the auditorium group. Uh, all of the major projects were agreed to in, uh, in whole. All the priority one projects were agreed to in whole. The one thing that was left out altogether was the natatorium. Uh, one group voted to add $40 million to CTE with basically a blank check without a plan, but a placeholder. So I understand, I understand the placeholder aspects of it, because as we move through over the next five years, six years, we're going to need to add two CTE, but in what realm? So what we asked Dr. Fagan and her team to do was get with uh, Dr. Morris and his, his group on how much money they need, what would that look like, and so forth. Um, the safe and secure schools is near and dear to all of us and feel like that um, we need to make sure that our police force have what, uh, what they need as well. So when you're, when you're looking at that, I think that there's money that needs to be added to both of those areas. Um, when it comes to the natatorium, this is a pretty hot topic. We've got some folks that are very, very passionate against it. Some folks that are very, very passionate for it. Um, when this process started, I was for it. Uh, as the process has gone through, uh, I believe that final vote, uh, I don't know this to be exact, but based on People that have spoken, people that have sent emails and so forth that were in those bond committee meetings. In that final meeting, I believe one group was around 60% and the other group was over 50%. So there was uh, the majority of the group 
were in favor of the natatorium in that meeting. Um, did it meet the two-thirds majority vote that was, that was handed down to the committee? No, it did not. I was fully expecting to come in here and fight for an auditorium. The more I've looked at it, the more I've looked at the cost, and I've looked at the needs that we have, um, I think that we should table it for now, my opinion only, uh, and do the due diligence. We have a list of all the different uh, uh, swim meets that we can go out and bid on, uh, all the community meets, all the national meets, and so forth. Um, I think we need to look at public-private partnerships to reduce the cost to the district. I think we need to look at uh, what the ep economic impact to our bottom line is and what the economic impact from a revenue side would be uh, before we take that to the voters for a vote. Um, so I'm not saying it's a dead issue, but my recommendation is that we, we table it to do some due diligence over the next couple of years while we're taking care of the immediate needs. Um, and, um, and I'll yield the floor from there. Thank you, Mr. Sitton. Uh, Mr. Lopez. Um, I'll, I'll follow up on uh, what Mr. Sitton just said. How I looked at it is that I took the uh, uh, bond, uh, Citizens Bond Advisory Committee's data, and I looked at it, and there's, there's a lot in common there, but there are some differences. And so th the way I see it is that if you took the least amount for priority 2.1s, which is $99 million by almost $100 million, and you added to that um, the, the, uh, the amounts for major, uh, major project costs and priority ones, um, and then lowered the CTE, uh, uh, you know, because you don't need the $40 million, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that in a second, what the analysis that we had performed. To build a NAT, you would have to take away from what the committee has recommended. And I, as a board member, simply can't support that. And um, the way I see it, and I'll explain it in more detail later, is that I think we're going to be a bit shy of the 600 million, but it's more like 10 million shy based upon my calculations, and certainly not, um, uh, uh, certainly not 50 mil, whatever the, the cost of the NAT was, 50 million or something like that. So long story short is is that uh, the way I see it is that we can either go for the full 600 million, give the districts in play, because all we're hearing about now is inflation. Um, the economy is starting to uh, boom, and, and so we've got inflationary pressures on us, and so we have to look out five years from selling this bond. We've got to worry about what things are going to cost two and three years from now. We, we need to give the district some play, so I, I would say that giving them $10 million of extra, because the last bond, I think we had $50 million, am I right? Mm -hmm. We had $50 million extra <coughs> for inflation um, uh, concerns. And so long story short is, is that it's... I, I just don't see how we can fit a NAT into the amount of money that we have and the needs that we have. I just don't, I don't see how that's possible. And I'll yield for now. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Uh, Ms. Morrison? Well, I'd like to say I think the committee did a great job. I want to say that. They took due diligence. They looked long and hard at the facilities assessment. And I agree with Mr. Lopez and Mr. Sitton in the sense that I love the idea of a natatorium, I do. And I think at some point in time, that'll come. But I think at this point in time, we have so many needs in our district. We have buildings that need a great deal of help. And I think the committee did their due diligence from that, build from that facilities assessment. So I'm gonna have to say, I would agree with the table at this time on the natatorium. Orson, Mr. Cunningham. Oh, your mic on, was that? <laughs> well, I wasn't ready to talk, but I can go oh. ahead and talk. Uh, uh, well, I guess I'm going to be the odd one because I'm in favor of a natatorium. But I do understand where you're coming from, 
and uh, I, I think some of the work that's been done, and, and if I've heard from the committee, and I want to thank the committee, is that there was a lack of information. Uh, within that lack of information, there was also some misinformation from, uh, from what I'm seeing when we talk about the number of kids that swim. Uh, I heard it was 300 uh, high school students that came up to a number of .007%. So, you know, my thing on that is let's, let's get our numbers right. Uh, because if I look at it, it's at athletics. I see that we, in, in the high school, I see we've got uh, 1,038 football players. Got 458 boys and girls basketball, 555 boys and girls soccer, 214 volleyball, 702 boys and girls track, and baseball is 281, and then softball is 172. So that puts swimmers number five out of all of the eight. So if that's a point zero zero seven, then Softball, baseball, volleyball, I don't know what they are. But I'm in favor of an auditorium, uh, but I will always, as we do, go with the wishes of the entire board at a president. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to also thank the CBAC and the work that they did. Um, I have already stated that I was pro natatorium at the last board meeting, um, and I still feel the same. Um, I do understand what you guys are saying, um, Mr. Sitton and Mr. Lopez. Um, I have one question to that, and you can answer it in, in a minute. You know, we were talking, you mentioned tabling the natatorium. Um, <coughs> but if you were to table the natatorium, I guess once we got that data, um, on whether we had partnerships and a strong business plan and the revenue and the cost, um, what would be the next step? Would you like to answer that now? Or? Yeah, I'd, okay. I'd, that'd be fine. So, uh, one thing that you've got to, that people in the audience need to understand is about school finance. You, whatever number we choose here, and if it's approved in May, those bonds won't be sold the, the day after. This is a six year program. So you've got to have the amount of capacity in order to sell a certain number of bonds. Uh, if you remember, we went several years without selling any bonds from 2008, so we just didn't have the capacity. After the recession, value, property values were down, we didn't have the capacity. So if, we, if it's tabled and we're able to do the due diligence and gather data and, and look at facilities and so forth, um, you know, somewhere down the line, there could be, if we have the capacity within um, uh, within the next five years, if we create that capacity, because every time we sell bonds, we generally try to pay off old debt as well. Right. Uh, so that creates more capacity as we go forward. So when we have the capacity, after we've gotten the data, uh, then we could go back to the voters again for another referendum interim prior to another major capital campaign bond like what we're doing right now. Okay, okay. I'd like to add yeah. a little bit to that too because uh, Mr. Sitton brought up the uh, public-private partnership and, and in th doing the, uh, the, the P3s, uh, what you uh, end up doing is probably having another entity, a governmental entity or a private entity, actually do the design bill on it and the school district becomes a partner in that where we could possibly be the owner of it. So there's all kind of opportunities out there to do it. Okay. Uh, 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 speaking of what you're saying, with also lowering our uh, capacity. I, I'm, I am in favor of, a, of an auditorium. Uh, I think right. it'd be good for our community, good for our school district. Uh, <coughs> but for the reasons I stated earlier, I, 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 I'd feel more comfortable tabling it, tabling it, mm -hmm. and, and doing the work that we're talking about doing before we go back to the voters for a reference. And you know, and I've heard you know the the statements from the CBAC and their their um, recommendation, um, but I've also heard from parents, community members, staff members, faculty on both sides, and there are strong arguments and rationale in support of and against. Um, 
I guess my position is, you know, I believe it best as I represent the constituents that elected me um, to have the nav natatorium as a separate uh, proposition item um, to let the voters decide um, how we proceed. So that's how I feel at this at this time. The, the, the problem the problem with doing that, and this is because I've thought yes. about that too. This is the problem with doing that is that. We have to have, because we desperately need, I think one of the speakers mentioned tonight, and she's right, that we, we desperately need the lion's share of this, this bond to pass because we have schools in desperate need right. of, uh, of fixing them. And uh, long story short with that is that how much is that going to be? And if you carve out $50 million out of that money, you're now going to have projects that the committee identified as major projects, priority ones and, and two point ones, even at the low ends of the two different um, sections of the committee that you wouldn't cover. And I think that that's basically uh, rejecting what the committees did. And so, you know, if depending on how you work these numbers, you can work the numbers. I think the max you can get is $26 million if you lose, use the uh, low numbers from the Longhorn Wildcat Cougar group and Lions. And uh, if you lose, use their low numbers, reduce the uh, CTE from 40 million to 15 million, and I'll, I'll touch on that again in a second, um, you, um, you use those low numbers, you would have 15 to 20 million, I think, right? About 15 to 20 million leftover funds. Well, now you're $30 million short and still can't build an auditorium. And so um, that's, the, that's the problem with that, of trying to break it to a separate bond. You're, you're, you're having to um, not do the priority 2.1s that either group um, recommended uh, to us. And one other point um, on the safe and secure schools, I'm 100% in agreement that we need to add money for that. I mean, it's that's the most important item in my opinion. So, thank you, Ms. Dixon, Mr. Carnegie. Yeah, and I, I share a similar point of view on the natatorium. I, I don't have a, a horse in the race in any form or fashion. I don't have a swimmer in an umble ISD. Maybe someday, not yet. Um, I think it could be great for the district in terms of being a helping enhance our image as a destination location. So I see that that, that positive aspect of the auditorium. What I struggle with is I haven't really been presented with any kind of detailed plan that shows a how much it's going to cost, b how we're going to how we're going to operate the auditorium, and then c what that might impact the impact that might have on the rest of our budget. So I have concerns with. You know, the, the growth of the district overall and how we would weave whatever deficit that might create into our budget and, and until that's clarified I, I can't really support this instead of saying that maybe we should spend the money on the, the 2.1s uh, the other point as well for me is we've got a lot of people that have suffered lots of personal damage because of hurricane harvey and i think we need to be very responsible with the way we're spending this money so i think we really need to be cautious and make sure that we're really spending on what we truly need and so I'm not, I'm not necessarily opposed to the natatorium. I just think without a, a, a more clarified plan that can really give us comfort that it's going to be a, a wise use of money and we've got lots of partnerships as well and extra money coming in, that maybe it's not the right time you know, to, to pull that out. That's kind of where I stand on it. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Um, just also just speaking on the one um, mm -hmm. item with regard to the natatorium, I tend to share the feelings of my colleagues as well as those who have reached out to us. Um, emails, texts, phone calls, lunches. Um, uh, like Colin, I don't have really a dog in the race, um, so it really helps me to understand that more from the perspective of those who it really does affect. And uh, um, I really appreciate those who shared that in detail. Um, I do share the concerns that I feel it's not particularly the right time for us, given the lack of data uh, to support it. Um, a lot of some, it feels like a lot of assumptions perhaps are being made. Um, and in addition to your um, point about um, Harvey victims, I would also, uh, it worries me to approve. I, I'd love to take it to the, uh, my personal preference at first was to let the voters decide. I think that's reasonable. Um, but I don't want to take that money away from uh, these other priority projects. And I feel like um, that 
we have the chairman of the board of the education committee on our <laughs> legislature in our <laughs> district who is arguing on our behalf to fix the funding formula and I don't think it would send a good message for us to uh, divert those funds away from uh, these priority items uh, for repair so I'm, I'm in agreement with the, with y'all on that so I think um, we're pretty much in agreement on the natatorium issue, but we, there are a few other items that the committee didn't have uh, clear direction on. Uh, we'll let Mr. Lopez, you want to lead that? Get that on the CTE. Um, you know, CTE is a big deal for this board. Um, we think it's important. Um, and one of the uh, bond groups, again, I think that was the, the Bears? Longhorns, my bad. The, 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 the Longhorn, uh, they put that they set forth, no, wait, yeah, the Longhorn group set forth, you know, basically $40 million, and I understand what they were doing. They were saying, look, here's a placeholder for, you know, Mr. Scarfo was, I think, one of the, the chairs of that. Uh, here's a placeholder for CTE. We think CTE is important, and uh, I agree 100%, but um, I'm not the type of person that likes to give, um, uh, and I know Mr. Scarfo isn't, certainly isn't either, but he, that he communicated that, you know, we need to figure out how much we need to set forth on that. So we need a plan. We need a, we need a you know, basically a three to five year plan. And so the administration has put that together for us. And, um, and, and basically what they came up with um, right now uh, to, uh, for the high schools, middle schools, and the CTE, current CTE building and programs, it's about $13.8 uh, million. Um, uh, my thought process on this is because, again, we're looking out, you know, five years, we have inflation issues, is that we round that up to 15 for bond purposes. If you take the $40 million, subtract, you know, 15 from it, then therefore we save $25 million um, off of that number if you look at the, uh, the matrix from the Bearcats, if I'm, no, the Longhorns. I'm getting, I'm getting those two confused. I've got the two spreadsheets up here right now. But the, the Longhorn, Wildcat, Cougar, Lions uh, folks. And, um, and so, uh, but I think it's important that we include that in this bond and make sure it's accounted for. Um, uh, for CTE, 15 million bucks. 15 or 13? Well, it's 13, but I, I'm rounding up because we're trying to proje project over the course of five, six years. Well, it was like 13.8. 13.8. So I'm, so I'm rounding up so one point, so. yeah, one point, one and change. So, uh, Madam President, if I may. Mr. So, if you, if you took that 15 million projection for CTE, which is what the what the plan, the long range planning is showing us. You add in the amount that uh, was requested by the uh, Bearcats group for the uh, emergency operations center, which was somewhere. Sure. Yes. Yes. Do a yes on the. Emergency operation. Not emergency operation. You're talking about CTE, right? I'm sorry. CTE. CTE. Yeah. We'll, we'll do the CTE also. What we're going to do is that's what their original cost was. We're just going to hard code, replace that with 14, uh, $15 million. So take that one out and put $15 million. Okay. Yep. Then Oh, is that how you got there? That's the difference between the numbers, between the 90 and the 1? So now if... So just, just, just kind of the just amount of work I look. I mean, you know how many hours that would have saved me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's in that explanation document. It wasn't the set of instructions, and evidently I sent to all the other groups. Okay. okay. All right. That makes sense. Because <laughs> <laughs> I kept looking. Hey, the priority two point one. What are we gonna do here? Okay. So, so the EOC, if we put yes on the EOC expansion, that's brings in about five point nine million dollars. So what does our numbers at the bottom so look so like? <laughs> And that leaves uh, 
So, so if we if we rounded that now to a hundred million, we would be calling for a bond referendum of uh, five hundred seventy-five million, basically. Am I looking at that right? So instead of your math is correct. Thank you. I think that's me personally. I think that's a very doable situation. Your, your. Can you what, say that again about the EOC? Okay, so, so if so, what we've done here is we. EOC or CT? Which one are you talking? Now, what we've done here is we've added the money in for the EOC expansion. That the, the entire package. Yeah, that that one committee recommended. And then on the CTE package, it was recommended 40 million, but the plan that that, that came back to us right. uh, is basically 14 million. So we rounded that to 15 million. So if you add those in along with all the projects that both groups agreed to, the major projects, the priority ones, that leaves you with 125 million and some change for priority 2.1. Okay. So. My recommendation is to give us some capacity in the future, uh, but allow us to to go and and I think the group that was putting forty million in CTE had like ninety nine million for priority two point ones, so we round that one twenty five down to an even hundred million uh, for Dr. Fagan and her team to prioritize the two point ones. That would have us calling for a bond referendum at five seventy five. It creates some capacity for the future, and and we're not leaving really anything on the table based on what the two committees came to an agreement on. So what is the uh, excuse me, Doctor? What is what is the EOC number? I mean, so we're, I'm looking at 15. It's it's what? It's like 5.5. 5, 5, 5, 5, I believe. 5.89, and right. not saying we take away from it, but. Uh, we still have the uh, transportation center up north it's included. It's already, it's, it's already in there. It's included. It's included. The ag farms <coughs> included. The transportation is included. They agreed. To, both groups agreed to all of that. Well, my, uh, well, my, well, my question is, you know, because part of that EOC is expansion of a parking lot. It's if we're building uh, another transportation center up north. Then do we really need to expand the parking lot when they can use a, the existing parking lot because we're losing? <laughs> For the EOC. Uh, what, sir? No, I'm, I'm just I'm mumbling to myself, Charles. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So what you're saying? Well, well, my point is we got 275 buses, I, and if I heard it right, 100 of that would be with the new that's transportation right. center. Yeah. So that's parking spaces there, instead of building a parking. Uh, I don't know what that number would be. So do we need that whole number? I went to the the um, facility study for that specific uh -huh. Okay, reason. good. Yeah. But I didn't see an item, a, a line item broken out for extended parking. I thought that was included in there. Or am I wrong? That parking would not be transportation parking. That's parking related to the parking lot for the EOC. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's what the cost is in here, correct, Rick? Or am I wrong? For the EOC alone. Yeah, for the EOC alone. But I'm just saying, do we really need to expand parking when you're going to have all the extra parking? Yeah. I didn't. That's what I'm saying. I looked at it this afternoon. I didn't see a lot out of. Oh, wait, I found it. It's 120,000. Was that all it is? Expand front and back parking lot. Okay. Oh well. All right. <laughs> and, and what will happen is any of those? We will find those that are in 2.1 projects or major projects. We'll find ways to value engineers and say we will have those roles and our monies that are available to handle additional 2.1 projects at the end of the day, or as y'all did in the past, buy land or do the other things. Well, and like you said, if you uh, bundle some things at the, at the same time to do all the turf or whatever. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so this has both of those numbers in there, the 15? Or and the CTE. six, be right. That's, the, that's what he's saying, yeah. Yeah. Basically six. Yeah, 15 is six. And then, so and then what it, can you clarify about round down to 100 million for two Yeah, points? so we've got 125 million left. 
Uh, we can we can call for the ent the entire six hundred million dollars. Oh, so the one twenty five is because of the six hundred number. It's yes. not. Yes, oh, yeah, okay. that's what's left over. Oh. So what I'm saying is, instead of okay. utilizing the whole six hundred million, we make the math easy. We round it down to a hundred. If you look at one of the groups, they were at ninety nine million. The other group was at one hundred thirty three million. So you're still giving. Uh, considerable amount of money for the two point ones, but you're also leaving some capacity for the future. And uh, uh, as we sell bonds and we pay off some old debt and so forth, it creates a cushion if we do need to go out uh, to the voters for additional bond money. Mm -hmm. The issues, I mean. Back when we had, you know, bond 2008, and uh, we were passing that bond, we were talking at the time, we, our next bond, we're gonna have a high school in there, for sure. I even think we had a sign somewhere on Lake yeah. Houston Parkway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because we, because we, everyone thought yeah. that was in the bond committee, everyone, that our next bond was gonna have a high school. And then we looked at the numbers and how we built Summer Creek, and, and um, uh, we're not gonna need a new high school right now. And so, Things change over the course of five years. It's good to have capacity. I mean, when we had our last bond, and like when recession hit, we we were we had no capacity, and I think it's good to have that cushion uh, moving forward because we're going to have to go back and uh, you know mm -hmm. several years, five six years for another bond because you have other schools that are going to need to be replaced, <coughs> Foster and um, <laughs> and, so, and, and so North Bell, um, so. Um, but anyway, long story short is, is that uh, I, I, I like the idea of uh, not selling the entire capacity right now and uh, having, having some, uh, some, some wiggle room in case we need to go back to the voters you know, three, four, five, six years from now, or when we have to go back to the board voters. Yeah, on Mr. Lopez's point, I think the thing I was looking at is going, going through the facilities assessment was I was a little bit surprised there weren't more schools covered in terms of adding in additional capacity. I know we talked about being a fast growth district and that was my main concern is making sure that we have enough capacity. We're not having to get up extremely large class sizes, that kind of thing. So I know there were two elementary schools that were proposed or at least talked about in the facilities assessment. I think ultimately one was recommended because of growth patterns from what I understand. And then I looked at the middle schools as well and it looks like we're right up to the capacity uh, based on what's in here in terms of our, our projections. So I think it might be helpful if we could just talk for a second about plans for new elementary schools, new middle schools, I know the high school has been discussed as well, but we are broadly when we think that might happen, just to make sure we're covered. I'll, if I could always start, and then um, I don't know if Dr. Brown wants to add. As far as, so at the high school level, we did obviously a reassessment <coughs> with Summer Creek having about 1,000 seats um, and monitoring the, the sort of build out rate in the south side of the district. Um, it doesn't appear that we would need that high school during this bond period um, because we have appropriate capacity there to handle that. And um, as far as the middle schools go, as you know, we're opening middle school nine, now Westlake Middle School this fall, which gives a, a lot of relief to Timberwood Middle School and a little bit of relief to Wood Creek Middle School. Then we have in this bond package, middle school 10, which is next to um, Ridge Creek Elementary School. That will provide a great deal more relief for Wood Creek and also handle the growth of that area. So we feel that for that, for that five year period, uh, the middle schools are, are handled and um, as you know we have a, a number of temporary buildings at Wood Creek Middle so we have some flexibility uh, with the current buildings and it's important to time our building uh, in a way that it fills those buildings when they're opened and, and that we don't have under capacity issues. As far as the elementaries go, uh, in our conversation around Lakeland Elementary we would actually increase the capacity of Lakeland which takes a little of the need off of the River Pines, Whispering Pines area um, and slows our requirement for that additional elementary school that we, we had in there that the committee actually removed um, because we will have uh, a new elementary school. You just approved the uh, Lakewood Pines site. That will be a new elementary school and then there's an additional one uh, that would be in this bond. So we would have two brand new elementary schools in that five year period that would um, meet our needs for growth in that part of the, the area because um, Lakeland Elementary would help us also 
uh, by moving their capacity up uh, by 200 students, I believe. Is that right, Nolan? I think we're going to be taking them up another 200 students, which takes pressure off that side of, of, the, uh, of the school district. So as we looked across all of the, um, the needs and the growth, we believe we have that, that staged correctly uh, to meet the needs of the district for the next four to five years. Yeah, and I will add, you know, on the, the, the Lakeland expansion, uh, the rebuilding with, with more seats, I think was the, was the key to that. Because now we, you know, we can, uh, we can move, move some programs around. We've got some ESL programs and different things. I'm not saying that's what they're going to recommend, but when you put it on paper, you can move programs and move bodies of people without drawing the dreaded boundary, uh, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and create that increased capacity that we need. So instead of building three schools, you're building, you're building um, uh, two. You know, rebuilding one and then adding another new one, so. Uh, and, and staying on that capacity issue, I, I need to ask a question that probably Nolan or you or Roger could help me out. Atascacita High School, it's, it's also included in here. With an expansion of a, uh, was that for 400? Okay, and so, and, and, and what was that uh, cost again? Uh, my computer's down, so. The total cost for both is. Uh, just, just for the task of seeing. Yeah, 5.6 yeah, for 400, and so. I, I guess I guess my, 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 as we're talking about capacity, you know, if that's the case, because it looks like you know, people love their schools and don't like to move. Uh, I don't actually foresee another high school for a long time, and given what the cost is going to be, uh, the last time I heard, by the time we're looking at it, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 million. Uh, so we'll have to have a lot of capacity space. So that looks like all the other high schools would be good candidates for uh, wing additions. Uh, but in speaking of that, I know that there's two elementary schools. Uh, Timbers for one, and Fall Creek for the other one, that the entire fourth grade class is out in T buildings. So are we just going to keep on and, you know, leaving that as it is, or is that a p potential? Is there room for it? Just asking a question. I mean, since we're already talking about planning on building other elementary schools and middle schools, but what about the schools that are still, uh, that are existing now, and with a whole class that's actually outside the building. Just a thought and comment. It, it does have that, right? So, the, so I think the answer is, um, I think the question is, uh, will one of the elementary schools in the bond relieve um, Fall Creek? And the answer is yes, that is part of the plan for the, the school that is built after the site of Lakewood Pines. You know, I think uh, uh, after this bond, we'll be very close. You know, we'll, we'll have to look at the numbers as far as a new high school or another middle school from a, as from a new school standpoint. I mean, we've got the <coughs> acreage on Lake Houston Parkway, and, and that's where, in theory, those would go. Uh, but I think beyond that, it's going to be a paradigm shift in our capital building program, uh, to answer your question, to really look at the older facility, facilities, the aging facilities, uh, do we continue to put money into them to keep them up and running? Or, as in the case with Lakeland and Kingwood Middle School, uh, have they reached their, their, their lifespan? Uh, you know, like a Northville, like a Foster, that were around back when I was in elementary school. And so I'm old as dirt, so. Uh, but uh, structurally, they're, they're okay right now uh, with the work that Kenny Kendrick and his group has done to keep those running. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I do think that after this bond program is done, there will be that paradigm shift to uh, rebuilding, wing additions, you know, remodels and so forth, those aging facilities. Can I just add one thing? Um, Rick Bland mentioned the, the unifier study, and I think one of the things that I'm proud of in this, this district and this conversation is that we take some of our older facilities and we, we measure those against our current standards 
for what we expect to see in a building. And then we, we look at that and say, well, to bring this facility, North Belt Foster, up to uh, the level of our current standards for uh, libraries or uh, classroom space or maker spaces or whatever, it would cost this amount of money. And if the amount of money that it would cost to do that is, is again, over 60% of what it would cost to be to build new, it just seems to make a lot of sense to um, make sure that we have opportunities for all students in our district, no matter where they live, no matter how old their school is. And so I really appreciate uh, the bond committee embracing that idea for Lakeland Elementary and for Kingwood Middle School. Because if you've been to those <coughs> schools, you know that they are not similar. Um, to the, 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 the sort of schools that we're building today, to, middle, uh, to Westlake Middle School or to the Groves. And Dr. Yeah. Fagan, I'm glad you actually said that because one of the things that I really, um, that's really important to me across the district is what is our district standard for facilities, academics, everything across the board, and I think it's really important for us to consider that always, so thank you. Is there other discussion? No. So going back to my, my homework here, you know, the number that I arrived at is because I took a compromised position uh, between the Longhorns and the Bearcats <coughs> on the 2.1s. And, and this, I'm just throwing this out there. Is, is, uh, I arrived at in, in basically the same calculus that uh, Mr. Sitton did. And uh, basically, instead of chopping off, bring it down to 100 million, my suggestion was is to bring it down um, to 15, 115 million, because uh, 116 million is the is the, the average between the two groups, um, uh, and so that's you know. That would be a bond capacity. Then uh, we go to the voters for 590 million, leaving a 10 million dollar capacity. I'm just throwing that out there. Those are the numbers that I arrived at, in which I was. I might as well talk about all the work that I did. So that that's. Yeah. So that's that's where that's where I got um, is what I was going to go to the board at is is uh, go to the voters for 590 million. I would lean towards the 100 million just because you give the, the uh, administration a little incentive for finding those opportunities for savings. Um, and if we're not anticipating going back to the voters in a number of years, uh, we would have to reassess that those needs and we'd have an opportunity to do that then. As much as I appreciate the work that Mr. Lopez did uh, <laughs> in having to recreate uh, metrics and a spreadsheet because he didn't know how to work this one. Um, I, I can appreciate that, but uh, yeah, I would like to go with the uh, the 575 as well. Ms. Dixon? And I'd be inclined to go a little lower as well. Um, I, I know some of the capacity estimates were based on certain valuation assumptions, and I know we haven't really seen what valuations have done because of Harvey. So I think if we err on the side of caution and maybe allow a little bit of cushion in there to make sure that we don't get caught by surprise on what the valuations do in the short term. Maybe that might be an option for us. It might, might be beneficial to think that way. Good point, Mr. Uh, Ms. Dixon. And I was just going to say also, I think having the greater capacity, um, it could also change things for the natatorium in the future. Because if we get partnerships and these things come to fruition, then uh, we have some capac capacity there to go out and uh, reach out to the voters. We, uh, if I, I don't want to devote our conversation, but uh, Mr. Sill, we asked you to look at uh, bond capacity, future capacities, and so forth. Did everyone get a copy of that uh, report that he did? Um, so your projections were very, very conservative as far as the growth is concerned. Uh, do you have any concern about uh, capacity issues with a 575, 580 million dollar bond referendum. Uh, <coughs> well, our safety net for capacity issues is exactly what the board has done in the past. The capacity isn't there because the value growth doesn't occur. We have to sell the bond. Um, so I, I certainly, given the history of this board.
think that we will position ourselves um, whether you go with $115 million or you go with $100 million. Um, I think you will position us so that if we have a need to go back to the voters in four or five years, whether it's with an auditorium or, or an additional elementary school or whatever it is, um, we'll be able to do that without and still maintain that, that service tax rate. So I'm, I'm delighted with what we came up with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snell. <laughs> Don't just tell us what to plug in. Uh, I, I, my, the difference is 15 million. I mean, I, I'm fine with, with 575. Um, I'm okay with that. I mean, th that's, the, that's the difference that we've been, that Robert and I have been talking about is 15 million. Hey, Mr. Carney, what, what's your number? I like the 575 idea. Like I said, uh, I've got a little bit of concern in terms of valuations. I think we're probably safe. I think we've been conservative in our history, but we never know what's going to happen in the short term. So I would be much happier and feel better if we built in a little bit of capacity and if we need to go out for some interim bond at some point for something else, then that gives us that ability to do so. I, th I think it's important to, to, you know, as we talked about capacity in school finance with what Mr. Sill just talked about, uh, we will not sell those bonds unless we have the capacity to sell those bonds. So that may mean 80 million one year, 120 million another year, and so forth. So, um, you know, through through the finance department, uh, Dr. Fagan and her cabinet, and when we're going through the budget process each year, you know, what is our capacity at that point? Uh, what kind of bonds? What are the interest rates looking like at that point in time? Um, and what would be prudent for us to sell so that they can in turn plan their capital projects. So Nolan, uh, you're gonna be busy for a while if this thing passes, and, um, uh, but the budget process is gonna be very, very important uh, because we're gonna be looking at capacity, looking at trying to do bond sales along the way, staggered like that, uh, and adding that to the budget as far as those capital projects, capital improvements. So, so can we just take the twenty-five million dollars out of there? I'm going to make it just a flat hundred million dollars. One hundred million. Sure even. Or what do you want? One hundred three ninety-five. That that should bring it. Yeah. We we'll just, <coughs> just round up. Five, six. Five seventy four and change. Round up five seventy five. <coughs> All right. Is there any other discussion? You ready for a vote? Uh, an amendment. We need an amendment. <coughs> we need an amendment. Mr. Parliamentarian, are you ready with an amendment? All right, Madam President. Uh, I move that the board amend the motion and the order calling the bond election to authorize to change the amount of the bond uh, to a bond in the amount of. $575 million. All right, the amendment has been moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion regarding the amendment? Having no further discussion regarding the amendment, all those in favor of amending the motion? Unanimous. Um, so the amendment having passed, any further discussion regarding the motion as amended? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, approving the order calling the bond election as amended in the amount of $575 million. Those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you all, I'm tingly too. <laughs> Y'all made that easy on me. Woo. Next item of business is uh, information item number 6A, financial services reports. Any questions for administration? All right, any uh, future board business, item 7A? All right, there being no further business, uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>